please make sure that it's working. So uh, let me start, since uh, we have a, an audience of people from different horizons. Well, it doesn't go to the next. OK. Let me start with a, really a very simple textbook slide to tell you, to remind uh, some of you that in the cell cycle, most of the time, the cell is uh, spending uh, doing uh, gene expression uh, and re uh, replication and then so on. So the interface, as you see on the third slide, is over 90% of the time. Then after G1, S, so replication, and G2, we enter into mitosis, which doesn't last very long, but uh, is essential, of course, for the replication of the genome and then the subsequent division of the cells. So this is just to tell you that interface, biologically speaking, is uh, of very great interest and it was very difficult to study until not long ago. Uh, things have changed recently because there was a new technique which uh, is uh, playing uh, a new, uh, it's a new approach in which you cross-link whatever chromatin strands are in vicinity, they are cross-linked, then everything is uh, degraded by a DNAs, and then, of course, you can sequence the, the pieces which were cross-linked, and so you can establish the number of contacts you have in the interface nucleus. So this is the, the approach, and uh, I don't understand. Okay, okay. So I say something, I, let me see. So the point I want to stress right now, because it, it is the only slide which has to do with big data, is that in a very recent paper, it is less than one year old, uh, what has been done has been to look in a cell, a human cell, at these contacts. And five billion contacts were studied to realize that the number of a very basic structure, which was discovered very recently in the interface nucleus, are the loops, those loops which you see in, uh, on the slide. The mean size of the loop is 185 KB. The number in a cell is of the other 10,000. What the other point I want to stress right now is that you can have different situation loops within loops, and the important point is that every loop is at the root of the loop. At the base of the loop, as you can see, those red spots correspond to what are now called architectural proteins. Architectural proteins are very specific for some short sequences on DNA, and two of them join and uh, make the, the so-called boundary of the loop. So the system is a system very complex in, in the human genome, but which is now under study in different laboratories using this approach, which is the contacts and what I described a moment ago. So uh, the question I want to address today is a, a, a question which had no answer so far. How can the same DNA sequences, because of course they don't change during the cell cycle, 
can, how they can function in this three-dimensional architecture, which I just described, so all the loops within the interface nucleus, how they then can fold in the very compact structure of metaphase chromosomes. Everything is compressed to the extreme. And then, after the end of mitosis, you go back to the original interface architecture. It is absolutely essential that the architecture, which is now in the uh, second uh, cycle, is identical to the first one, because it has been shown that it is enough to have changes in those loops uh, to alter gene expression. So it is a new level of regulation which is extremely important and which was not recognized until a few years ago because there was not a, 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 a technique, an approach which allowed to, to see this level. So it is a level in which, just to give you one very simple example, if you displace the base of the loop, you have an alteration, serious alteration in gene expression. Vice versa, you can recover, in some cases, the expression of silent genes by changing the base of the loop. So many things happen at this level. Now the question is, uh, how can we understand, uh, answer uh, the question which is uh, on the slides and which I just described? Uh, the solution which I am going to propose briefly today, because we have a short time, is that there is a connection in, re in reality between these architectural chromosomes from interface to metaphase, so all during the cell cycle, with the compositional organization of the genome. So this is a very important point because it means connecting some feature, which is the architectural chromosomes, with something else, which is the genome organization. And then I have to tell you which way we have approached the, system, the problem, and it is something which I call compositional genomic, and it is simply uh, looking at short sequence frequencies in the genome. So the, these short sequences are, were studied originally by a particular ultracentrifugation technique, but later on, of course, on DNA sequences when they became available. Now, the short sequences determine, on one hand, the fine structure of the double helix, slightly different in, uh, according to the composition, and the interaction of DNA with proteins, uh, histones to build nucleosome, transcription factor to interact with regulatory sequence. So in other words, gen compositional genomics is based on genome structure and function. This is our approach. What happens if you use this approach? I give an example. Uh, with uh, human chromosome 21, which is the smallest one in our, um, our chromosomes. And you can see that the GC level goes through different uh, uh, levels, in, uh, is different, different uh, uh, stretches which go from blue to red in uh, this particular slide. So the compositional profile is very particular. This is something which we discovered many years ago. And uh, you can put, of course, all those uh, regions which are a similar or a quasi almost identical composition into something which we call the isocores. So regions of similar base composition. And the bottom part of the slide shows you what happens if you do that using a method which just uh, published. Uh, so you see the isocore profile. And so now our problem is to connect to try to connect this particular situation, which is true for, of course, for all chromosomes, and not only human, of course, but all vertebrates and even invertebrates, with the, the problem of uh, chromosome architecture. So before I move into that, I should remind you that if you put all the uh, isocores, which, are, which have a certain base composition together into beans, you see that you have different families. And these different families are characterized by different properties. In fact, there are two major uh, separations in uh, the distribution of those sequences. The GC poor 
One, uh, the, I call the genome desert, we call genome desert a long time ago, simply because it is gene poor, very few genes, is late replicating, close chromatin, and the GC rich, which is the minority, which is extremely rich in genes, early replicating and open chromatin. So this is the two aspects which you can immediately see if you look at the human genome or other genomes. Now, Without looking at all those details, I can tell you the, the following. There is not a single functional or structural property of the genome which is not related to base composition. In other words, f I t take just one example, uh, gene density. Gene density, as I just said, is high in one compartment, which is called the genome core, and very low in the genome desert. But what uh, applies to genome density applies to all possible properties which we have studied. In other words, this fractionation into isocores is not simply a, an exercise in segmentation of DNA. It is related to all the properties which we have studied. Now, what we do is simply to ask the question, are those two main spaces, what I call the genome core and the genome desert, related to interface chromatin? Because this would be a first step to understand really the connection between genome organization and, and uh, chromosome architecture. And you can see, well, actually, we have a very long list, but I simplified and I show you some examples. On one hand, of course, you have what I just described, the two genome spaces, genome core and genome desert. And then, according to the method, methods which are used, other very different methods. For instance, in the case of domains and borders studied by Van Stensel, it is what DNA is bound to the lamina and what is not. And you look at promoters and the CTCF, which is one of those architectural proteins, and, this, and so on. Again, uh, not only in this case, but uh, uh, in other ones, and this is a uh, really non-exhaustive slide. Again, what you can say is that there is a precise correlation between the two main um, uh, fields in uh, chromosome organization with the uh, interface chromatin. Of course, this is a very general thing. And you can say, well, of course, there is a correspondence, but the correspondence is 150 to 50, or it is something completely different. There is one experiment which is very interesting, and actually the slide shows you this, and it's a very important point. If you take, you can do the following experiment. You take, look at the synthetic regions in mammalian genomes. Synthetic regions mean regions in which you have the same set of genes, okay? You take a, uh, the same set of genes, let's say, in mouse and in men. Those are two synthetic regions. And we studied these already 10 years ago, and we found that the compositional landscape, so the isocores, were conserved. In other words, not only you have conservation by definition of the genes in the synthetic regions, but in addition, you have a correlation with the base composition in those regions. Now, in 2015, so just a few months ago, it was shown something very, which we expected, but was not shown before, that in the interface architecture of the chromosomes, the loops are also conserved. So, in other words, the, in synthetic regions, on one hand, you have conservation of the compositional landscape, on the other hand, you have the conservation of the loops, which means that you must have a correlation between the isocores and the loops. And this is what we want to look to. Uh, and I, I will explain why there is also a practical interest, not only a purely scientific interest, but even a practical interest in what I'm saying. So please keep in mind the following point, namely that there is a correlation between the architecture now at interface, and it is the most complex architecture of the chromosomes, and the composition landscape, which is looked just at the human DNA sequences. So what I conclude 
to be more explicit, is that the DNA sequences of genomes encode not only proteins, as it is well known from, <laughs> for, for I don't know how many years, but also the three-dimensional structure of interface chromatin, because if you have this correlation, this is what you should conclude. Now, uh, I move one step further, one step further. You remember that when it was discovered that we have 20,000 genes or so, 25, and the same thing happens in a worm, it was a little bit humiliating for us to have <laughs> essentially the same number of genes as Drosophila or uh, the uh, nematode. Now, if you look at genome size, you realize that there is an enormous difference in these dif three species. These are three examples. Because in uh, the worm, you have only 3% in terms of genome size compared to men. In Drosophila, you have 4 point something. So the conclusion is what was called junk DNA, the DNA which is not coding for proteins, is largely, it is the word largely is missing in the, in, in the slide, regulatory DNA, because we know that all that DNA is in the loops, and we know that the loops in turn are very important in terms of gene expression. So you see all these connections. So now let's move and we go a little bit into more details, but it is very simple because the base of the reasoning is already, uh, I already just said. So practically, you have a situation in which, on one hand, you have the genome desert, genome corso, that stretch blue with the, the uh, small uh, red bands which correspond to the genome core. On the other hand, what is called now topologically associating domains on the right side of the slide, in which, because of what I said before, the loop is GC poor DNA, so the GC poor isocores, then there is the, uh, the associated, sorry, the architectural protein, which makes the link at the base of the loop, and then you have the part of the, the, the loop, which is called the boundary of the loop, and the boundary of the loop is the place where you have active genes, promoters, and, and, and so on. So, in fact, the bottom part of the slide shows you the situation which is uh, in, uh, right now in, the, in the, the literature. There is many, many different uh, uh, articles, of course, appearing since uh, the approach was possible. <coughs> so, what is shown here is that you may have larger loops, which are called the TADs, topological associating domains, and inside those TADs, you have subdomains. So you can imagine how complex the situation is. Now, this, don't forget, has to go through a system in which you have mitotic chromosomes, so a completely different structure. So the paper which is now in press shows which way you uh, can understand this very uh, incredible phenomenon. If you take as early as possible a mitotic chromosome, so early prophase, what you find, and you look also at different other stages of the mitosis, uh, you find that th th the number of bands is equal uh, to the number of isocores. So the uh, uh, values are going from metaphase, which is a small number of bands because everything has been compressed, prometaphase, mid-prophase, and the very early uh, prophase is of the order of 3,400 bands, which correspond to, to the number of isocores. So the proposal we have made, and I, of course I don't know now into all the details, is simply that to go from the interface structure to the metaphase, because this is what you need to do, is to go to a extend completely the, uh, the genome and refold it. In, uh, the, you have to go through a 10 nanometer structure, which is that linear structure, which is 
uh, over there and refold it in the 30 nanometer uh, structure of chromosomal bands. So this is uh, essentially what we have found. The, an important point is that there is a, a paper from China which is extremely important, which, in which they showed that chromatin itself may form a double helix. And I like very much the idea, even if there is no proof now, that the folding of, into the 30 nanometer fiber happens because of this uh, uh, formation of a chromatin double helix. But now uh, let me simply say that if you proceed by a further and further coalescence, you reach a situation in which the, uh, the all those uh, uh, folds are aligned on the architectural proteins which make the, uh, the array, uh, the, the, the axis of the chromosome. And so the bottom uh, uh, figure is the situation which you find in mitotic chromosomes. So you compress everything to the point that you have the architectural proteins which, as I said before, are carried over in mitosis. Now they become the axis, the discontinuous protein axis of the, of the chromosome. So let me go to, uh, this is a brief summary of what I said. So the, to understand the changes in chromosome structure through the cell cycle, you have to go through the opening of interface domains and subdomains. You have to go back to the folding of this extended configuration into the 30 nanometer fiber loops. And then you have to have a process of coalescence which leads you from prophase to prometaphase to metaphase. So the changes in the point, a very important point of this slide, which is the bottom two lines, is that the changes in chromosome architecture according to these schemes are reversible. So in other words, you can go back because you don't forget it is absolutely essential to reform exactly the same, the same loops, the same domains that were there before. Otherwise, the cell will not work. So I think I conclude by saying something which is uh, uh, important. Even to me, it is obvious, but apparently not to everybody because there are many, many papers in which one talks about stochasticity here and there. And uh, what I'm saying as a conclusion is that there is order in chromosomes. And Rabel in 1885 predicted that the system was such that it could only be made in a way in which order is absolutely essential. So this is a conclusion. I will, since I have probably another few minutes, I want to mention another point. What is the genomic code? The genomic code is simply the existence of precise rules. First of all, something which we discovered a long time ago, the correlation between the GC levels of contiguous coding and non-coding sequences, and even of the three codon positions. So the genome has an isochron structure. So uh, if a gene is GC rich, you will never find it in a GC poor area. All isochors and uh, all tested properties, as I mentioned before, are related, so the genome is an integrated ensemble. And the last point is the one which I discussed a, a, a moment ago, namely that the, the genome is organized in an order chromosome architecture, and the genome organization and chromosome architecture are the same thing, which is, in a way, after you discover that, it is obvious, but it was not at all before. Last slide is, uh, I think there are four pillars in molecular biology. One was the double helix model, and of course, uh, well, in a couple of years, everything was solved, as you know. Regulation of gene expression and the discovery of messenger RNA, the genomic code, and now we have one more thing, which is the genomic code. So the set of rules which underlie the structure and functional organization of the eukaryotic genome through the cell cycle. And 
I would like to stress one thing. Not knowing this, and we know this only very recently, means missing a very, very important point if you are interested in genome evolution. Because uh, so far, of course, it was not taken into consideration that this structure, the loops in interface in the majority of the cell cycle are so crucial for the function of the cell. And so I conclude by saying that there, are, there is one more pillar and it took a long time to discover it. Let me see if I, well, this is the names of the people who were involved in the experimental work for many years, actually only for the most recent years. Thank you very much.